Thank you very much um, for uh, the organizer for inviting me. Um, it's a really nice location. I'm really happy to be here. So what I'm going to talk about today is the, the vaginal microbiota and uh, what we've been doing over the past um, few years. Um, but uh, before I start, I just want to give you some, some little background, uh, not as provocative as, as Gregor has been, but kind of a, what I call the, the common wisdom about the human vagina. So people think that, like to Bacillus, um, his characteristic of the uh, healthy, normal uh, vagina in reproductive age women. And, and I hope that uh, this, this might be challenged um, uh, throughout my talk and you, you'll be able to understand this. Um, the, the thought is that lactobacillus and other uh, lactic acid producer in a, in a vagina can fend off the growth of non-indigenous uh, organism, and that include uh, pathogen. The problem is that we don't really know how this is done, and that's the big problem is mechanistic. Uh, it's thought that low pH, which is driven by the production of lactate, um, mainly by, uh, produced by uh, lactobacillus and other lactic acid producing bacteria, is actually driving this, this mechanism. There's other uh, organic acid that are also produced in the vagina, but those are not thought to play actually very good beneficial role. A lot of people talk about hydrogen peroxide, but that's also um, a big problem because hydrogen peroxide is mainly the result of the uh, uh, aerobic uh, make, uh, metabolism, and the vagina is definitely anaerobic. And of course, um, uh, Gregor mentioned bacteria sin, which also are produced, obviously, by lactobacillus and could actually contribute to this uh, protective mechanism. So the, the vaginal microbiota is actually a very interesting microbiota to study because, as opposed to, to the other uh, microbiota, it has its life as in, of its own throughout a woman uh, lifespan. Um, at birth, um, the vagina is, is actually sterile, but it's rapidly colonized, actually, by lactobacillus. And this is driven by the maternal estrogen that's uh, circulating into a baby girl or baby boy, to that matter. But uh, in this case, a baby girl. Uh, that, that estrogen is going to uh, trigger the maturation of the um, vaginal epithelium, and that maturation comes with the accumulation of glycogen. This glycogen becomes a good source of uh, nutrients for lactobacillus and ends the colonization by lactobacillus. But after three or four weeks, uh, this estrogen is now used up, and lactobacillus is going to disappear, more or less, and it's hard to grow uh, in the period uh, from th uh, three to four weeks to, to puberty. You can't really see much uh, lactobacillus. You mainly see uh, strict anaerobes uh, in the vagina. At puberty, you have an increased level of estrogen, uh, uh, production of estrogen. Now we have a complete community shift in composition. Uh, we see lactobacillus coming back. And uh, we're going to get a microbiota that's going to be pretty much uh, uh, similar to what you're going to see throughout the reproductive age, where a lot of glycogen uh, is metabolized uh, to produce lactic acid. And you can think about pregnancy, actually, as a hyperestrogenic state, uh, where you can see, actually, a lot of um, uh, lactobacillus as well. And then at menopause, we have the opposite happening again, less estrogen less glycogen, less lactic acid, and a shift, a very slow shift where lactobacillus start to disappear and other strict anaerobes are, uh, are coming back. But what I'm going to talk about today is mainly about uh, women of reproductive age. So what does the vaginal microbiota look like? So just to, uh, to look at, at this, I'm going to describe a study that we've done um, in, uh, in asymptomatic healthy women. And this is a, a cross-sectional study. And it was a pretty well-powered study uh, where we had over 400 women that were asymptomatic and healthy. They were represented in four different ethnic backgrounds, Caucasian, Black, Hispanic, and Asian. And those women self-collected vaginal swab using uh, validated methods. They also uh, measured their uh, vaginal pH. We uh, collected information that's called the Nugent Gram stain or Gram uh, stain score. And you just think about it as a, an estimate of vaginal community disturbance. This is something that's done by Gram stain, so it's only morphology. So it's a very rough estimate of vaginal community disturbance. And of course, we had uh, a lot of questionnaires uh, involved. And we determined the composition using, um, this is actually an older study, so we use 4 5 4 power sequencing of the V1, V2, uh, region of the 6 ns RNA gene, and I guess I, I don't have to go into the methods. Uh, so what does it look like? And here's what we found. So I'm just going to walk you through this, uh, this figure. What you can see here is each vertical line represents one woman, and so we have 400 women. 
The colors on this uh, heat map is indicated here. So yellow means uh, one of those 25 taxa here is present at very low abundance, and red means it's present in very high abundance. So clustering those um, uh, microbiota uh, based on their composition abundance of their different members uh, led us to the identification in this particular study of five major group, which we call community state type. And those groups differ by their uh, microbial composition and abundance. What was very interesting is that, uh, first of all, those clusters were pretty clear as opposed to what you find in a gut, which is still actually very, uh, 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 the point of uh, many debates as to is if there are any actually uh, state type or enterotype in the gut. But here, those types were actually very, very clear. Four of those types were actually dominated by one species of lactobacillus. We had lactobacillus sinners, crispatus, gasseri, or jensenite, which form those four different types. And then we had a fifth type, which unfortunately is called community state type four, uh, which uh, lacked very much a significant number of lactobacillus and comprised a pretty large diversity of uh, bacteria that were pretty much anaerobes and strict anaerobes. So if you do the statistic this, you would find this in pretty much 95% of healthy women um, in those uh, ethnic background that we study. So one of the things that's uh, uh, with, with those type of heat map is that you can't really see the relationship uh, between the different groups. So if you plot this in uh, three dimension uh, using uh, principal component analysis uh, methods, what you can see is that the different state type actually are gonna be uh, clustering at the um, vertices of this tetrahedron shape, while this community state type four, which lacks lactobacillus, tend to cluster in the middle of this uh, tetrahedron. But what you can see here is what I call the microbiome continuum. It, it appears, remember this is cross-sectional study, each dot here represents a woman, um, it appears that this, this microbiome, this vaginal microbiota is more of in flux than we think. Um, you know, you, you can see um, women which microbiota is, for example, here between a state type one and state type three, which is dominated by crispatus and inners, meaning that this particular woman here has about 50% of crispatus and 50% of inners about. And so is this a state that this woman has at all time, or is that a state in flux for, for going, for, for example, from a, a state dominated by crispatus then is now dominated by inners? And so the question that we need to ask is, can, we, can a woman at any time in her life be, uh, be present in this space, at, in any place in this space? So can a, a community dominated by crispatus be one day dominated by lactobacillus jensenii and so on? Can this community, this microbiota navigate throughout this space? So what I'd like to, uh, to talk about when I think about this, I call this um, the vaginal community space. So it's, it's the space that a community might be able to um, uh, enter at any given time. So um, on top of this uh, figure, you can actually plot some of the interesting metadata. And one of them is this Nugent score that I mentioned. And you can see that this community state type four is actually very much associated with what we call high Nugent score, which is often associated with bacterial vaginosis. So it, it, it's used as a diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis in a uh, research uh, setting, mostly. Uh, but remember, those women were completely asymptomatic and uh, otherwise healthy. And you can also see this association with both with high nutrient score and pH. So what we see is that this community type four is associated with high nutrient score and high pH. So for us, this is the question that becomes very important. So how long does this state persist over time? So if a woman is in this community state type four, how long is she gonna be in that state um, when we start um, adding time? Because we feel like, and we hypothesize, that this is how frequently, the frequency at which a woman is gonna enter this type of microbiota is gonna be key. The frequency and the duration in which a woman is gonna stay in that state is gonna be important. So to study this, the only way to do it is by looking at what we call the dynamics of the vaginal microbiota, and you have to study, uh, to do a longitudinal study, and you have to follow women over time. So the study that uh, we did, uh, we enrolled over 150 women, and it was a prospective longitudinal study. So those women were enrolled and followed over time, and whatever happened, happened during this study. The women collected daily self-collected um, uh, mid-vaginal swab, and they did this for 10 weeks. 
Um, every day, we also got vaginal pH measurement. We got a gram stain, so one of the swab was rolled onto um, a slide. And we uh, collected daily um, information, such as sexual activity and hygiene and so on. Uh, the woman came back uh, twice after enrollment, at which we actually performed a clinical assessment for bacterial vaginosis and any other condition. And we did the same study that we did uh, uh, previously. This time, we used uh, the V1, V3 region, so a little updated on the uh, 454 uh, technology. And we did this for 50 of the women, because obviously, this started to, to be some pretty large number of, of sample to process. So I'm just going to summarize this very briefly. Um, we pretty much found three groups of longitudinal pattern. The first group represented by those two women look like this. And you'll see a later, uh, you, this is a woman in red here is Lactobacillus crispatus. Uh, those two spike of, of orange here is Lactobacillus enters. And here's you, you have time. So those two spike here uh, correlate with menses very nicely. Here you have Lactobacillus enters, pretty much omnidominant during the, uh, the 10 weeks, and a little spike of actually uh, streptococcus uh, during those uh, menses here. So we have very stable pattern, which are only disturbed, uh, well, uh, in which the community change only during menses. The second type of pattern that we observe could be represented by those two women. And those two women here have what you could call somewhat stable pattern over time. But one of their uh, highlights is that they um, either have no lactobacillus or have very few lactobacillus, as indicated here by this orange. It's a little bit of lactobacillus in ours. So this one, we did not detect lactobacillus. In this one, we uh, detected a little bit of inners, but mainly uh, Gonorella vaginalis was the dominant species here, and Atopobium vaginae was also the dominant species here. So those two women never reported any symptom, never sought medical attention, but if they had gone to a doctor, uh, looking at their nutrient score, they don't have lactobacillus. They might have been diagnosed with bacterial vaginosis and then treated by, with antibiotic. Uh, but those women never um, sought medical attention, and I can guarantee you by looking at their daily activity, actually were never really bothered by, this, uh, by their vaginal microbiota. And then the third type of woman that is this kind of, of patterns, which are very erratic patterns. We keep changing all the time and alternate from some dominance, some of lactobacillus, and period where lactobacillus is pretty much absent. So three types of patterns. Um, some of those women, and I did not include it in there, actually were diagnosed with bacterial vaginosis clinically and were actually treated, and, uh, but that's for a complete uh, different talk. One of the things that we were interested in is trying to understand what are the factors that drive this variation of stability that we see into those patterns. So we modeled uh, what we call the Jensen-Shannon Divergence um, Index, which is, if you want, is, is how fast now that we have, we can see how this, this index change over time. So it's, if you want, it's how stable the community is, how fast it's changing from one time point to another. And this is what you get. So the Jensen-Shannon is a very nice index because it, for us it goes from zero to one, it's normalized. And you can see that um, here during the first five days of a cycle, uh, the, the index is very high, meaning the community is changing very fast. And high index, which then tend to become uh, lower uh, mid-cycle, and then a second uh, minimum about the, second, the middle of the second part of the cycle, and then it comes back up, where the community becomes a little more unstable. So unstable and stable during the middle of the cycle. And one thing that you can do is map on top of that uh, the level of estrogen and progesterone that a woman experiences uh, throughout the menstrual cycle. And you can see very nicely that the two minima, meaning the community are most stable, is when estrogen is at its highest, and the second peak with uh, progesterone. But one thing that's very interesting is the, the, this, this idea of having uh, uh, this community state type four uh, in healthy women. What does it really mean? Um, we see this uh, quite often. I would say in about more than 50% of the women experience a community state type 4 uh, for at least more than five days um, in, in our study. So what is this community state type 4? And I like to call it an healthy state that carries risk. 
And this is the, the reasoning that I use. At any given time, if you take uh, the study, cross-sectional or longitudinal, we have 25% of women who have this non-lactobacillus dominated state. This state, we know, is often associated with high nutrient score and high pH. And we know that those two values, no matter what, how you calculate them, have been associated uh, with uh, increased risk for sexually transmitted infection, um, acquisition and transmission. That included HIV. And it has also some uh, relevance to uh, preterm birth. So a state that might be healthy, but might be associated with some risk. So those women are often normal. They appear otherwise healthy, but they definitely at this, they have an increased risk of um, those ad for adverse outcome. So this is our hypothesis. We feel that community stability and dynamic, meaning the frequency and the duration of this state, might actually represent uh, better the risk to disease. If you go into that state once every two months, this is your window of risk. But if you're in that state every day of a month, your risk is very high. As soon as you get exposed to a pathogen, you might get infected. The chance to get infected, if you're only there in that state one day a month, is, is much lower. So we think that low stability equal low resilience and equal increased risk. So really, it becomes a community ecology. So what we need to understand is the molecular basis of this association between stability and susceptibility. And this, we've done this using uh, some more uh, elaborated omics technology. So stability and the community genome. So the question we're trying to answer is, is there a correlation between the genomic content of some of the species, mainly of lactobacillus, and the community stability? Meaning that if good is lactobacillus dominance, what is it in that lactobacillus that can actually maintain dominance and being resilient versus some strain might not be able to do this and uh, you might have uh, low stability. So we use a metagenomic analysis of microbial community and uh, using a, a, a pipeline that we developed you can actually uh, end up with full assembled uh, genome uh, of the main member of that community and perform comparative genome analysis with uh, the known genome that are in a, in a database. Before I move forward, I want to just set up the, the stage for the, the, uh, one of the slides that will be coming. One of the things that we're interested in is obviously the risk to sexually transmitted disease. And one of those diseases is chlamydia. We have an ongoing study where we enroll women who have chlamydia we sample them, we treat them, and then we see them uh, three months later, and then uh, every three months uh, for nine months. And I just want to show you what does the vaginal microbiota of a woman who has chlamydia look like, and what does it look like three months later. Here's the two studies. So here you have a group of 100 women uh, here when they have active chlamydial infection, and here you have them cleared of infection three months later. What are the major difference? Difference number one is that if you compare this to healthy women, and those women are mainly uh, uh, African-American in Baltimore, so if you compare to the same healthy population, first of all, we only see two uh, community state type. Community state type that are dominated by lactobacillus inners, or this community state type four, which are dominated by lactobacillus, uh, uh, by uh, gonorrhea vaginalis. In healthy women, we see, obviously, women who have crispat, lactobacillus crispatus, lactobacillus gentsoni, and gasseri as well. Now, cleared of infection three months later, the only thing that we notice, really, is a little bit of increase in, in lactobacillus crispatus, which is still less than what you would see in a, a never-infected uh, population, and a much increase of lactobacillus inners group, this community state type three, and a small, and a decrease of community state type four, the one that like lactobacillus and is dominated by gonorrhea vaginalis. Okay, so this stir up our interest for lactobacillus inners. It looks like if you can think about those women being a subset of the women in the healthy population that are susceptible to chlamydia, if our hypothesis is true, those lactobacillus inners here which you can find pretty much in every single one of those women, actually might put a woman at risk because that lactobacillus sinners might not be as resilient as, and being able to dominate the community at all time. 
Lactobacillus inert is very interesting. It has a very large pan genome, meaning that every time you're going to sequence a new genome of Lactobacillus inert, you're going to discover new genes. Okay? So Lactobacillus inert is very diverse. So a very uh, interesting genome, a very uh, interesting association with chlamydia. So let's look at uh, all those genomes of Lactobacillus inert. So here is a study where we picked women where we've seen them several times. So some of them are longitudinals collected. And uh, you can see women who actually have lactobacillus sinners that's associated with Garnola vaginalis. So those will be what we call CST4. Then you have women who are pretty much dominated by lactobacillus sinners. And you have, uh, I think one of them, you can see it very, a little bit here, is as some lactobacillus gasseri with it. And uh, a third one where lactobacillus sinners kind of share the, the dominance with lactobacillus jensenite. Three groups. We were able to, using metagenomics, so this is not a 16S um, compos based composition uh, heat map. This is based on the metagenome. And you can actually reassemble the genome of lactobacillus sinners and build a phylogenetic tree. And this is what we see. So right away, by using the, the, count, the, the gene and the, the region that are still shared among all those lactobacillus sinners, um, what you can see is that the lactobacillus sinners that are associated with Garner vaginalis are more similar to one another uh, than the one that are, for example, share dominance with lactobacillus jensenii and so on. So there is some genetic basis in the association that we see in the composition and the genome of lactobacillus sinners. But what's more interesting, and like I said, those women, the one that we have two sample, came from community for which we had longitudinal information, is that now we can map the longitudinal stability onto this, this map. And this is what you see. So the first two women here, the, so I didn't plot the, the two sample from the same one because they're the same, and I'll discuss this in a minute. Um, what you can see here is that those two sample came from the community which where lactobacillus sinners is having a hard time dominating. It's mostly dominated by, in this case, atopobium and gonorrhea, and here, atopobium. However, if you look at those community, they come from community where lactobacillus sinners is almost always dominant. And here is, in brown is actually lactobacillus uh, jensenii. Here is the woman that I showed you earlier uh, that has lactobacillus uh, and inners and streptococcus spiking during menses. And then you have this woman six here, which pretty much cannot, has a very hard time in maintaining dominance. So this is high frequency of change, and here is pretty much high duration of community state type four. Okay, so it appears that there is an association between the genetic of lactobacillus sinners and the stability that it induces uh, it has in the community. So now coming back to those lactobacillus that are coming from uh, women who have lactobacillus sinners. Uh, here's their metagenome uh, uh, composition, uh, derived composition, and you can see that all those samples have lactobacillus sinners. So they're in colored here are the one that comes from a woman with chlamydia, and in black are the one from the uh, other woman and some uh, reference genome. So you can see that we have uh, lactobacillus sinners that are associated with gonorrhea that are uh, by themselves or associated with either Crispatus or Jensenai here. And so we were able to repeat this analysis, and this is what we found. Here's a big phylogenetic tree, and the first thing that you see is that, first of all, there's different branches, meaning that lactobacillus sinners might have different uh, phylogenetic origin, but the first most important one is the fact that in those circle here are the women that are from the chlamydia infected, there are chlamydia infected. And you can see that those women, those, those lactobacillus sinners clustered only on three branches of this tree, okay? On this tree you have, in blue here, you can see the lactobacillus sinners from the study for which we have longitudinal sample, which I've already showed you. In black is uh, genomes that come from uh, a gene bank for which pretty much we have no information. Gene bank is it's really bad for this. So, Having those blue genome allow us to uh, map on top of this tree now the, the stability of the community. And this is what we find. So you can see now that the genome where chlamydia uh, is associated with has been infected. You can see are associated with community that are either uh, uh, pretty much in a constant state of um, uh, 
uh, they lack lactobacillus very often, or they have a very high frequency of uh, a state of community state type four, while those other branches still maintain their trueness, if you want, to stability as well here. Um, sorry, as well here, this is uh, a lactobacillus that's associated with CRISPRs, and I'll talk about this uh, in a little while. So why is this important? So one of the things that we know now is that there might be some lactobacillus that might put women at risk. So we'd like to know if those lactobacillus sinners and others, maybe crispatus and so on, actually are associated with those with a woman for a long period of time. Because this is going to be important when we want to start thinking about therapies, like probiotic therapy. Can we actually displace a community to replace it by uh, another uh, strain that might dominate the community? So the thing we did, you remember that first study that I showed you was 400 women? Some of those women came back and were enrolled in that longitudinal study. So we had the opportunity to look at the genome of the lactobacillus of those women, which were enrolled two years prior to the longitudinal study. And I'm going to take you very quickly, very briefly through those women. And you can see that um, we have a genome of lacto lactobacillus gasseri that we had prior to the study and after, so in 2007 and 2009. Those women only uh, those two lactobacillus genomes differ by 43 SNPs. So very stable uh, over time. On top of that, this genome is also very stable uh, throughout the 10 weeks uh, period of study. Now here is lactobacillus jensenii, same thing. There was only 14 SNPs separating the genome isolated in that woman in 2007 versus the one in 2009. Lactobacillus crispatus, 35 SNPs separating the two genome. And lactobacillus inners, we had two genome, those two of inners, uh, were at 17 and 21 SNP, while the third one was at 7,000 SNPs, meaning that it is possible to acquire the new strain. This is definitely a new strain. This is not evolution over two years. This is definitely a new strain of lactobacillus inners, which is colonizing this woman. How can that happen? And this is when this case study comes up. So, Here's a woman who was dominated by lactobacillus crispatus and then experienced uh, a bout with bacterial vaginosis. And you can see she report vaginal odor and vaginal discharge. And then after this is kind of like half dominated by lactobacillus sinners, lactobacillus gasseri, and lactobacillus crispatus. But then all those different organisms, gonorrhea, atopobium, privatola, and so on. We did qPCR on sample that were collected prior to this uh, event and after this event. And we could not find uh, all the gonorrhea, privatola, atopobium were not found into those samples, were found in those samples, even after. Most importantly, lactobacillus enters was not found in the sample prior, but was found in the sample after. So what's this before and after? If you look carefully, this woman during the entire 10 weeks, had one sexual intercourse, vaginal intercourse, unprotected sexual intercourse. And that, and on top of that, this little circle is blue, meaning in our coding, meaning it's a new partner, meaning that this new partner delivered pretty much an inoculum of lactobacillus sinners and all the other uh, BV-associated organism uh, for this woman. So meaning that you can have sexual transfer of vaginal microbe. So if you can have sexual transfer, why not? That opens the possibility for truly manipulation of the vaginal microbiota by us administering a probiotic. So with that, I'd like to conclude that, um, just to summarize that, we, we find that the type and abundance of microbe found in a vagina can vary over a short period of, of time. In some women, one in others, uh, it can be actually uh, very stable. The change can often coincide with menses, but sometimes do not. And we find this actually a very personalized type of change. Uh, to some extent, we, we also, I didn't mention it, but sexual activity tends to destabilize the community. And I think this, this last example was a good example of that. Uh, genomic uh, content of individual member of the community might actually predict community stability. And we have this this hypothesis that community stability dynamic actually might represent a, a, a better risk uh, to disease. But most importantly, lactobacillus strains appears to be very personalized. 
And if you compare all those strains, even the, the gas rye in one woman to a gas rye in another, they, they are just definitely not the same. Uh, and they can colonize for a long period of time. And we can also see that there could be acquisition of novel strain. And this is the potential for a novel vaginal probiotic. And with that, I'd like to thank some of the, my collaborator at the University of Idaho. Um, I've been working with Larry for over 10 years now. Uh, my group at, at IGS, uh, some of the clinical group that's uh, been involved in collecting the sample at the University of Maryland. And of course, the funding uh, through the uh, Human Microbiome Project and all the grants uh, from NIH. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions, please? Thank you, uh, Jacques, for a very nice talk. I have lots of questions, but um, can I ask two, maybe? Yes. Um, one of them is, um, have you already mapped the relationships between the different uh, l um, you, you know, the different uh, genomes, uh, with uh, Lactobacillus crispatus? Have you mapped that out, like, similar to the way you did this with, um, you know? Inert? Yeah, so, so the different, you, you, are, you presented data on um, the relationship between different, you know, the, like the ENAS is very uh, variable, so you're finding lots of SNPs, yeah? So uh, what well, I'm asking is... Yeah, lots of SNPs across SNPs, but not within over time. But did you look at relationships with Lactobacillus crispatus, which... So in crispatus, it's the same thing. So it's, it, within a woman, it's, it's, when it stays, it's very stable, and it evolves very very slowly, just at normal rate. Um, but you mean in terms of stability of the community and, and inners and yes. crispatus? Yeah, but then specifically between those two. So between the two different types of lactobacilli in terms of co-occurrence and stability over time. Oh, with co-occurrence. Um, when inners is present, uh, you find it in, in, in communities that are dominated by crispatus, you find them during menses. So you don't see them kind of like co-evolving or co-habiting the vagina that much outside those time. And I think it's mainly because uh, it's an environmental shift in terms of both nutrients and so on. And some of the, 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 the gene that Enners has actually could predict some of this. Uh, but um, uh, they don't really compete uh, within outside the menses. Okay. My, my second question was, um, you did not mention how um, candida species um, play into all of this, and obviously you mostly looked at the 16S gene, so you didn't pick up on them, but have you thought about doing that in your future work? Because I think the candida species play a very important role in all of these dynamics, and it well, would be really nice to... Yeah, so we, we have all the diagnosis of candidiasis or candidosis, as you say here. Uh, and, and we actually don't see, I mean, they, we have 17 events out of the 160 women that experience um, uh, yeast infection. And uh, we don't really see an association between dynamics or even the type of, of community that you have in candida. So you, you, have, you have women that have candida and the, the, the community is not changing. While they're experiencing symptom, you see lactobacillus crispatus being just unchanged. But then you have another woman that has inners and things keep changing during, during the, the yeast infection. So it, it's hard to decipher if the microbiota plays a role in, in with, interact as much with yeast. Uh, yeast likes low pH and I think the two might cohabit pretty well. There's been some studies that published that shows there's little relationship between the microbiota and, and uh, the event of yeast infection. So I don't know if that, that will play a role. Uh, could you just comment about the, uh, the community stability and versatility uh, compared to the host immune system? Um, actually, not in this study, because we haven't looked at, at uh, any, any immune correlate on, on this particular study. But that's something that's a call I, I make. I mean, this is where we're going now, and that's what we're doing with our newer study. But sample needs to be collected appropriately to do this kind of, uh, of analysis. And, and you know, when we started, we didn't really think that way. But now we realize how important the immune system is in, in driving a lot of that. Um, 
Yeah, we, we, we've, we've done, a, we had only a, a, a brief questionnaire at study entry. And uh, they are, it, it's, it's not very clear, you know, it's, it's, it's not the best way. I mean, we would like to be able to follow this over time. But uh, I truly believe that, that food is gonna, is gonna play, play a role. What we see is that fat in, intake uh, tend to be associated more. So higher fat intake tend to be associated with community state type four. So the more fat in your diet, the less lactobacillus you end up, you, you have in the vagina. So that's some of the association, but it's with um, you know, getting a, a very gross estimate of what, what women eat in general. It was not just particularly during the study. There's a question here. Um, so, um, um, some of the women had a um, high Newton score, right? And with the observation that lactobacillus in nurses contributing to unstable communities, would you recommend clinicians to stop using Newton score? Um, is Newton score useful in any way? Oh, so the. I guess the question is, should we continue using Nugent score, and is it a reliable diagnostic for bacterial vaginosis? So my, my understanding with Nugent score is that it's actually uh, not very much used in clinical practice. I mean, physicians don't take the time to do a gram stain and, and go, they do wet mount, they're gonna do what, what's called AMSL criteria, where they're gonna be looking at odor, um, clue cell, pH, and discharge. And that, it's physical thing, they can, the clinical things, the uh, parameters they can actually evaluate. Uh, and that's what's done in a clinic. Uh, Nugent score is poorly done. It's mainly done in the research. And I do believe that Nugent score is not a good estimate of BV, and I would not recommend using Nugent score to drive diagnosis and antibiotic treatment. Now, the, the big question is, is you know, like I said, it's, it's a state that's potentially at risk. What needs to be done? And we've done treatment by antibiotic, and it works well for maybe a month, and then it comes back. I mean, Gregor just showed, showed the data. 28 days, 28 weeks later, it was all back. We see it that within a month, women come back to what they were before. So there is something else that needs to be done. And, and so treating on the basis of Nugent score, I don't think it's gonna be a, a good thing, but what to do is the big question. <coughs> so over the time that you've been looking at this, just sort of on a very sort of simplistic level, do you think you can identify people where they have almost like a, the, the stability is so, if you like, permanent, it is resistant to any form of destabilization? Do you hear yes. comments about in the in your immune system or what you're eating or something like that? I suspect it's more complex than that. And if you could find some people like whose, whose population wasn't shifted at the sort of, you know, change in wind direction, you might find that to be a more useful group to look at. Have you made that, are you aware of just in terms of an observation, here's something where you think, my, you should have had a change in your population that you haven't? Yes, yes, and so we do, and I, I showed you one, for example, the one that is dominated by gastroi. So we have some of those women in, in every lactobacillus group. And, and they can have, I mean, some of them have very intense or frequent sexual activity, and there's absolutely no dis disturbance of the community. Menses just does a little blip. Uh, so those, those lactobacillus for us are obviously very important, and we've been characterizing them to potentially see if they could actually be good probiotic to use. Although there are host factors associated with the Definitely. Yeah, so one of our ideas is that that association between, for example, crispatus and, and the host that lasts over time, um, even if it doesn't last over time, there's something between host and crispatus that started way early at birth. And we know that from all the study that it's the mothers that provide the lactobacillus. And so the idea is that if you have a crispatus that's not able to maintain dominance at all time, we should provide you a crispatus that is dominant, not a gasseride that gives dominance. So th this idea of personalized treatment will come by, well, if you, you know, group four, or no, sorry, group red, let's say, we're gonna give you the red probiotic. If you group green, you get the green probiotic. 
So, but it will require annual exam to be typed and make sure that things are still there, it's the right strain, and if not, you can be complemented. So that, that's the idea behind this. But those needs to be rationally selected and evaluated before they even move into the probiotic um, field track. Okay, Good. thank you very much, Jack. Um, we're gonna move on now. Thanks again.